Hello, I'm Mari Perone, and I'm returning to continue our series talking about each of the books of the course with the subject matter of our identity. And of course, the course of love is so much about who we are. It's its crucial element is talking about who we are. And so who we are changes from one book to the next. And that's why I'm doing each separately. There's so much in the treatises that I want you to know right up front, I can't cover it thoroughly, uh, but I'll do some highlights for you. You know, the thing is, every time we know something new, who we are, our awareness of who we are changes a little bit. And so this is continually going to be going on because we're forever becoming new. And particularly, though, in this, these first moves to our newness are all about being who we are without the ego identity. And that is something that Jesus began to dislodge with a course of love. And some may have felt it completely, completely free of the ego after the first book, the course. And but some of us, and I, I know Jesus knows this because he keeps telling us that the ego is gone. So it's like, oh yeah, you're still hanging on to a little bit of it, but but now a little more is gone and a little more is gone. And so that's what's happening in this um, first treatise. And you know, I had a realization a while back um, where I saw myself having continued a, fa a pattern of family enmeshment and the thing is, when you make realizations, you go, my God, why didn't I see that before? You know, it's like, but things come to you in the time they come to you. And what we're hearing in A Course of Love is just sort of helping move us along in that way. And, you know, every uh, realization of this kind, like me saying that I had a pattern of family enmeshment is um, is painful, really. Change is painful. And I know we don't like to talk about that sometimes spiritually, but or a lot of people don't, but I do, because I think we can get hung up if we are experiencing something of a struggle. And change is messy. You know, change is just messy. So when we are getting to each of these new spots, that we are taken to with a course of love. Just like seeing something with family enmeshment, it's a messy process. I mean, I saw a therapist for a little while to help me get through it and to really speak it out. And I even thought of drastic measures more than a few times. And many people do take drastic measures when they realize something new about themselves. They feel like they don't fit anymore within a marriage or a community and or a job, you know, and they change that. And those are big events in our lives. And they call for uh, courage, you know, and they call for discernment and many things that aren't really uh, easy, even though we hear a lot about ease in this course. So I wanted to bring that up. And really all these things like enmeshment were taught to us. You know, it's like I learned this because the family of my birth had this problem. And then I carried it on into mine without even realizing that it was a problem until I did. So our learning is the cause of many enmeshments, really. And that's what we're discovering and leaving behind. To know who we truly are, we need a new way of knowing it. And in my view, that has to do with personalizing this course, because Really what Jesus is doing is turning the focus to us right from the beginning so that we do do that. We don't need to look to outside authorities. We don't need to look to our old way of learning in order to realize what this course is saying to us. We, look, we need to look in here. So that's one of the biggest things about A Course of Love. 
So I want to tell you just a little bit about um, each book. And I'm going to start with, of course, the first. There's four books in the treatises. The first is a treatise on the art of thought. And the funny thing is, is that I thought I was done when A Course of Love was done. I didn't know that more was going to be coming. And there was a three month break. And so I'm bringing that up there here because Jesus actually mentions this in this first treatise. And I'm really surprised nobody's ever asked me about it. So here's what I'm talking about. It's in um, chapter two when he says, the closing pages of A Course of Love instructed you to think no more. A break in time was needed for you to disengage the ego mind that produced the type of thinking that needs to come to an end. This ending is but a beginning in truth and has led you to readiness to learn the art of thought. So it was one of the few things that made me wonder about whether we should do a combined volume that Jesus said there was a break in time needed for us to disengage the ego mind before coming to the treatises. So if you ever feel that sense of needing to pause between each book, do so, you know, always follow your heart and what you sense is right for you. He goes on to say, we identified much for you to leave behind within the pages of A Course of Love. These many things which seemed so distinct and separate and which ranged from fear to struggle to effort to control and protection can all now be seen as the product of your thinking mind. To experience the truth and apply to that experience of truth the same thoughts of the ego mind, the same thoughts that were applied to former experiences of the truth would be to respond to love the same way again. The questions you've asked concerning how love could be the answer when it has been preached by so many for so long is answered here. The answer lies in your response to love. To respond is to answer. You have sought your answer everywhere, but here is where it lies. It is yours to give and can only be given from love, <laughs> given to love, from love. Only in giving is it received. And I think those paragraphs really sum up the essence of this treatise. The treatise on the art of thought also brings us our first mention of the elevated self of form, which we'll hear much more about later. And we find that this elevation is necessary because all change must begin in the reality where we think we are. We can't await some changed state, but must create the changed state we await here, now, in form. We hear that the ego has been separated from the personal self so that we can claim our personal self again. And we can truly, rather than falsely, represent ourselves, like going from that old enmeshed self to a true, healthy sense of self that's not enmeshed in other people's lives, you know? So when we represent who we are fully, we become who we are. Jesus calls this self-revelation, and I just love that. This is in chapter 4. Lay aside your desire for reasons for self-congratulation in favor of self-revelation. The same, the truth shall be revealed to you, is the same as saying, Yourself shall be revealed to you. And then in the ninth trap, chapter of this short treatise, we hear what was is being thrown out. And the first step in this 
is embracing what you heretofore have not embraced. You are pulling forth sides of yourselves that were previously undervalued rather than looking for an other to provide what you lack. Why were these sides undervalued? I think it's a really good question for us all to ask ourselves. <laughs> and one of my main answers is learning because learning taught us to fit in. Learning taught us that we were always trying to be something, you know, something better than who we are or trying to achieve something or trying to um, change so that we could find love. And all of these things were uh, among the reasons that uh, we were looking for others to fulfill us. And so we're leaving that behind. And the movement to wholeness begins there. And with pulling different parts of ourselves together, and the name of this is male and female. The feminine and the masculine. And Mother Mary is called on. And we're asked to reclaim the real act of creation, the bringing forth of the new, through union with the divine self. We hear that in Mary's life, the key to the riddle is provided and are called to a state in which what is begotten is begotten through union with God. So a course of love is now showing itself to be an embodied incarnational path saying it is through the blessed Virgin Mary's resurrection in Form, that the new pattern of life is revealed. The new pattern of life is the ability to resurrect in form, the ability to resurrect now, the ability to res resurrect in life. Thus is the glory is your to you in rather than in death. So this union of the feminine part of ourself, the part of the movement to our new identity. And this will be explored more later, later in the way of Mary. And this is becoming um, even more pronounced now. It's like you can feel it's important. It's mentioned here. It's mentioned in the dialogues. And now I'm receiving a new book on the way of Mary. So this is a movement into a time that's really ripe for us. And this treatise ends on such a note of peace, such a high note, you might say, that I thought we were done once again, but I was wrong again. And there was about a month delay between the art of thought and the next treatise, the second treatise on the t nature of unity and its recognition. Uh, we continue to, <laughs> in, uh, we hear about response. We heard about that in the first treatise too, even though I didn't mention it. And then we hear about it here again. And we're told that we've begun to realize or make real, which I think is a nice little correspondence of words there, to know that to realize is to make real that what we've learned and are to take on is a mantle of our new identity. I love that too, the mantle of your new identity. And we'll hear of this again too in the dialogues. To help us with this, Jesus first talks of callings. I loved the part on callings, having been called myself. A call, Jesus says, calls you back, calls you back to who you truly are. We each are called by the nature given us to unique ways and acts of being in the world. Jesus says, your call 
will bring who you are into focus within your mind and heart. It will bring it into focus through the, in your mind through the vehicle of your heart. I thought that was a unique way of saying it. So it's all, our calls are all about a change that must occur within and a remembrance of something that's existed in us. It's always been there, but we didn't know it. Again, like old family patterns can be, but really again, they weren't born in us, they were learned patterns, but they can feel like they've been there forever. So as we hear more about what occurs within, we'll see we've kept our courses theoretical. And now we must apply this course to our deepest selves. This new identity that is another state of being one that is not ego bound. This treatise also summarizes the seven beliefs of this course, but I'm not going to get into those since we're doing all four treatises today. After that, we have a final call and I'm going to read this to you. The final call of this treatise is, in contrast to those put forth previously, a personal call from me to you. By now you have seen that your fears of losing yourself to God were unfounded. By now you have seen that yourself does not need to stand separate and alone in order to be fulfilled under the mantle of individuality. You have been told to put on a new mantle, a new self, a new identity. What does this mean? Now that you have been made ready, I am ready to return you to yourself. So that is the end of a treatise on unity. And <laughs> I uh, didn't do as thorough a review of this one. And I love this one. Maybe that's why I didn't do it because I thought it'd go on and on. Now we're going to move to the third treatise. And I really should have showed you the book at the beginning. Here we go. This is A Course of Love, and it includes the course, the treatises, and the dialogues. And we are reviewing today the treatises. The third treatise is a treatise on the personal self. The treatise on the personal self is where we are again asked to never forget that establishing our identity has been the only aim of this entire course. Establishing our identity is the only aim of this entire course. Jesus begins by saying that our personal self hasn't represented our true self, hasn't represented who we are truly. But now, since we've separated the ego from our personal self, we can do this. We can be who we are. We hear that we can only get to new life by being who we are in truth. Isn't that good news? <laughs> we have an original purpose and our return to it leaves us blameless and unaltered. Blameless and unaltered altered. Now Jesus has by now said a couple of times that the ego is gone in some fashion or another. And now in the third chapter, he says it definitively. The ego is gone. <laughs> he 
who says it. And this is followed by the only error possible is that of not being who you are. That's what the ego was, not being who we are. The only error possible. So we can now be error free, unaltered. And as we continue, what is emphasized along with the rejection of the ego is rejection of illusion. There is great depth in the way of the house of truth that is spoken of in this treatise. And I'm going to quote a little from it. This is from chapter three. The work that is upon you now is that of replacing the house of illusion once and for all with the home of truth. The work that is upon you now is that of revelation of source. If the source of truth is within you, then it is your own revelation toward which we work. Now you can become the true self in observable, in observable form. And I want to share just a little piece from A Course in Miracles here, because when we begin to talk of illusion, we have more of a problem. But I found this beautiful quote, actually, I'm sure somebody passed it to me, but here it is. It's from two four. My true identity is secure, so lofty, so sinless, glorious, and great, holy, beneficent, and free from guilt that heaven looks to it to give it light. It lights the world as well. It is the gift my father gave me, the one as well I give the world. There is no gift but this that can be either given or received. This is reality. This is reality and only this. This is illusion's end. It is the truth. Well, between this incredible treatise on the personal self and the next treatise, which is my favorite, uh, Jesus came to me and said I needed a brief pause because and actually, I don't even think he said I needed a pause. I needed, here's what he said. I'm sorry. He said, you need to be totally in the new to receive a treatise on the new. So what he asked me to do was to stop everything I was doing. And what I was doing at that time was working part-time in my family coffee shop and meeting with the Course of Love group that had formed and with those who were aiding me and getting it ready to publish. The first book of A Course of Love was being published. It was published in a single volume at that time. And so I had many activities going on, but I was asked to stop all of them to be in the new to receive this treatise. And this is really the turning point. And I'll say this right up front because I'm very big on leaving learning behind. And this is where it is very definitively said that this needs to happen. I believe it's called for much earlier, but here it's really definitive. This course has, and this is actually kind of a nice summary paragraph I'm going to read here. This course has led you through resigning as your own teacher to becoming a true student and to now leading you beyond the time of being a student to the realization of your accomplishment. You were once comfortable being your own teacher. You willingly gave up this role and became comfortable in the true role of learner. You are now asked to be willing to give up the role of learner and to believe that you will become comfortable and more in your new role as the accomplished.
No, as I suspected might happen. <laughs> Getting a little mixed up. But we're almost done. This is the last treatise. So Jesus talks here of how our entire lives have been about learning. And he contrasts learning and relationship. Relationship happens in the present moment. Studying takes up residence within the student, there to be mulled over, committed to memory, integrated into new behaviors. Relationship recognizes that love is the greatest teacher. Studying places the power of the teacher in a place other than that of love. Relationship happens as it happens. Studying is about future outcome. What happens in relationship has present moment meaning. What is studied has potential meaning. The outcome of learning or what is studied is the production of things and perceived meaning. What we work toward now, toward now is to advance from learning and producing things and perceived meaning to producing unity and relationship through unity and relationship. In the very first chapter, we hear something is different now. You are beginning to become excited by the feeling that something different is possible. I know I was. In the fourth chapter, we hear, I am calling you to the new. I am calling you to transform. I am calling you to Christ consciousness. I am calling you to everlasting consciousness, even while you still abide in form. Here, we're called to make a choice to be who we are and told our choice matters. To believe that you are mortal is to believe that you must die to the personal to the personal self of form in order to be reborn as a true self. This is an old way of thinking. You do not have to die to re be reborn as a true self. Have we not worked throughout this course to return your true identity to you now? The joining of heart and mind in relationship is the joining of the personal self with the true self in the reality in which you exist now. This is happening now, here. Form has been but a representation of singular consciousness. As form becomes a representation of Christ consciousness, it will take on the nature of Christ consciousness of which my life was the example life, Jesus says. To sustain Christ consciousness in form is creation of the new. I'm sorry, I've, <laughs> I'm getting dry mouth. I forgot to bring a glass of water. So here we go. We're just going to finish on because we're getting to the end here. And if you have heard me speak before, you may have heard me speak about the end of learning and how I find it to be so central and how I really hope that course students won't stay students, that people who come to a course of love will move into a different kind of atmosphere that isn't one of teaching and learning. And this can be really difficult, especially for those who were in study groups for a long while with A Course in Miracles. It seems like um, such a wonderful way, and it is. There's many Course of Love group, groups now too, and that doesn't mean people aren't meeting in groups, but it's the kind of the teaching and learning aspect that while I'm not overbearing, I don't think in any way about the course, I keep my eye on that because 
what's really so key to us entering this new way, this new time, and embodying our true selves is being done with that. And it's being done with those ways in which there was some right answer given to us. And then a new answer given here conflicts with an old answer given somewhere else. And there's a continuation of conflict and reasons for divisiveness. And we're talking about unity here. And I want to be very clear about that. And that as we come to know who we are, we come to know for ourselves. And each of us has a distinct way of knowing and being. They're the same thing, really. It's like right now we're, just, we're separating knowing and being. We're knowing who we are and being who we are because we think we can only know who we are by learning who we are. So this is a very crucial point, and it's going to be followed up in the dialogues. And I'm very happy for getting this opportunity to tell you how essential I feel that this is, and how once you begin this journey away from learning, and really kind of, there's a certain helpfulness that there can be demonstrated in groups that is very um, familiar from A Course in Miracles, but not once in A Course of Love is helpfulness related to teaching and learning. So we are, the union and relationship that we're entering is a union and relationship of equality. We're not um, trying to be our brother's teacher or our brother's keeper in a way. We are here to really share as who we are. And it's in that sharing of who we are, not our opinion, not what we can quote from the course, but in who we are, what's happening within us, all of these things are going to be key to moving into the new time that we are here to be pioneers of. And if I haven't got my papers too screwed up, I'm going to read you um, a final quote here. maybe one somewhat large one and a couple small ones. Okay, this is from chapter nine of Treatise on the New. Do not accept lack of fulfillment. Do not accept the lack of fulfillment of a promise, a promise that has surely been made. Rejoice that the new time is here and be ready to embrace it as it embraces you. Realize that the self-centeredness of the final stage of your learning has been necessary. Only by centering your study upon yourself have you been made ready. And then this treatise ends with a prelude to the dialogues. And it begins like this. Welcome my new brothers and sisters in Christ to the creation of the future through the sustainability of Christ consciousness. Today we join together to birth the new. That's in the prelude to the dialogues that comes at the end of a treatise on the new. I may go back at some point and give more thorough um, summaries of these incredible treatises, but this is a beginning from which um, I can maybe introduce you to the movement of this course that continues to happen. And I am going to be very hopefully be back before the end of the year with the final summary of the dialogues to tell you of my excitement for that part, that really encompasses everything that we have come to be and know through A Course of Love. Until then, much love to you. <laughs>